cigarette smoking, one of the most explosive issues in our society today. Tonight, a group of doctors is almost quite literally fuming. Larry Menti tells us how the doctors feel the New York Times is hurting efforts to get us to stop lighting up. The New York Times made a local group of physicians pretty mad today. The physicians bought an ad on the front page of the New York Times at the bottom, asking you to go to a lengthier advertisement in the health check section. An advertisement that's really an article about the New York Times policy to run cigarette ads, even though it is editorially against cigarette smoking. Now, they think that that policy is pretty two-faced, and that's what they wanted to say back on the front page. The two faces of the New York Times, cigarette advertising and health check. Instead, the New York Times modified that ad to read cigarette advertising and the New York Times. The fact is that the Times has never asked a cigarette company to modify a cigarette ad in the last 10, 15 years, ever since cigarette advertising switched from television into the print medium. Marlboro Country. It was in 1970 that the federal government banned cigarette ads for radio and TV. Since then, the tobacco industry has been one of the biggest spending advertisers in the print media. In 1984, for instance, the New York Times took in about 15 million tobacco dollars. And that may be why a spokesman for the New York Times told us today that, quote, since smoking ads are not prohibited by legislation, smoking ads are run in the Times and will continue to run. Well, not only does the paper run the smoking ads, they aggressively seek them by running full-page invitations in the tobacco industry trade journals. You can't say that you're against smoking and then have a cigarette ad. You're promoting the industry. You can run any advertisement you want. You have to make money. It's uh, another contradiction in our society, but I don't see anything wrong with it. We should point out that every major municipal newspaper in the country runs cigarette ads, and it's doubtful that the New York Times will stop. Dr. Blum understands that, but he says if they're going to run the cigarette ads verbatim, they should run the physician's ads verbatim. Larry Menti, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. Thank you. The commissioner was kind enough to let me... Uh, I just thought that a picture's worth a thousand words, and uh, certainly in this issue, it's extremely important to understand the history of New York's background in the tobacco issue. It's a rainy day. It's time to be in for the movies and get some uh, some images to uh, do a little change of pace. And uh, what I've done is go through, this afforded me an opportunity to go through several thousand slides that I've uh, taken through the years of tobacco-related issues in New York. And I hope in a whirlwind few minutes to be able to give you a, a sort of a light refresher call on the history of tobacco in New York. Uh, I just want to thank the commissioner, too, by the way, for doing this. I maybe get a picture while we're here. So, uh, I appreciate uh, Christina and Anna and Melissa and uh, Phil for getting the, uh, the call, or Phil and Louise for organizing this. I got involved in this issue as a New Yorker in the late 50s when I was a boy following the Brooklyn Dodgers with my father. And uh, the interest was that my father was rather upset. He was a GP out in the Rockaways. And one of the things that concerned him was that we were watching Happy Felton's Knothole Hole Gang, which was a pre-game activity for little kids to come out and hit, run, and field. And it was sponsored uh, uh, by whatever the Vega department stores or what have you. But in the background was a Lucky Strike billboard. Back in the 50s, until they left town, the Dodgers were sponsored by Lucky Strike. The Giants by, anybody remember who the Giants were sponsored by? Hmm? Giants were sponsored by Chesterfield, which is Liggett. And the Yankees were sponsored by Camel. In the 50s, that became Winston. In the 50s, Chesterfield became uh, L&M. And in the 50s, Lucky Strike became uh, Tarrington. So these were the brands. And if you were to go back to the 1940s and 30s, our greatest heroes in this city, Joe DiMaggio, Lou Gehrig, were all working for Camel. Or the Giants were working for Chesterfield, or the Dodgers were working for Lucky Strike. Athletes could say they could smoke as many as they pleased. And when Don Larson pitched his perfect game at Yankee Stadium, by that time in the 1950s, one wasn't allowed to be in uniform promoting cigarettes as Joe DiMaggio and Mickey Mantle and, and Jackie Robinson, believe it or not, had done. By this point, the late 50s, there was a new code of advertising so that you could stand there holding the cigarette in the stadium. And this was still an icon cherished by most of us who were baseball fans. I grew up in an era where Marlboro Country was part of every nightly TV show on 42nd Street where Marlboro was created and, and run. The advertising agencies are here because New York is the leading tobacco state. This is the mecca for all of advertising and commerce 
and business and industry, and that's why we have to look at our own opportunity centric here to counteract that. They got the ads off here in 1971, but if you go to Shea Stadium and you were out there throughout the 1970s, 80s, and right through the 1990s, you would see any shot from television would usually be able to see the Marvel billboard at Chase. I don't know whether you can read the warning from the... But, but the fact of the matter is that this just went down just a couple of years ago, after over 30 years at Shea. Moving on downtown to Times Square, you remember the camel billboard? I do, even growing up. By this point in the 1940s, this was a fixture. This was what every tourist came to see. Back when it was built, it looked like this. And if you remember the smoke that came out, it was truly probably the most potent single advertising billboard ever made. That was replaced in the 1980s uh, with the, the, the famous camel character. And the, in the 1970s with a cigarette called Real. Real was marketed with the largest campaign in tobacco history. On, uh, it was everywhere, they said, but on painted rocks. You could go throughout Times Square and see Real surrounding Times Square. But this is your typical Times Square image. Moving down to 34th Street, the, some of the largest billboards anywhere in the world, back up to 42nd Street and 8th Avenue. This was, I think, the very largest billboard because this was two buildings. Well, we didn't like that. We wanted that off, so they changed it to this character. Uh, and then a few years later, it was gone. Now it's a bank ad. But, you know, I don't know whether the camel made a dent in, in terms of whether they sold more camels among kids that much or whether it was really a good thing for us to capitalize on. But be that as it may, right across the street was this figure, far more market uh, for our young people than that. I don't know whether you realize how big billboards are. I paid the guy at the store below to let me climb up on there. And that's literally how big it is. It is absolutely a great optical illusion. But then again, it went away. We got rid of it. Moving it down right a block away, 43rd Street, the New York Times. If you'd like to believe, and I've never missed an issue since I was 12, 13, that's fine, that the New York Times is on our side of this issue. But think again, it has traditionally never been on our side, except for the, the occasional editorial. It really has been in the in cahoots with the tobacco industry financially for many, many years. The New York Times printed up the Virginia Slims programs when Virginia Slims was at Madison Square Garden. This was an ad, this was an article on coronary heart disease, and on the back cover selling you a pack of wrist factors. The Times only banned cigarette advertising from its pages in 1999. Other newspapers had done this many years earlier. This was your typical sports page through the early 1990s. This was your women's page. People don't remember throughout the 1980s. Every single day on the women's page was Carlton is lower. And we also don't remember how the synergy worked because this was Gimbal's, a big light sale for Gimbal's, but we don't remember that Gimbal's at the time this ad ran was owned by British American Tobacco, and so they also used it as an opportunity to advertise the cool Cigarettes Jazz Festival in a Gimbal's department store app. Across the street from Madison Square Garden is always a cigarette billboard. Here's one for Winston. Moving further downtown, another one occupying the entire side of the building. These were the, the vinyl boards that they were putting up all over right until the very massive settlement that got rid of them. A more abstract billboard down more close to the village. And then moving toward Essex uh, Market, these totally abstract art pieces, this was for Salem, synergistically also simultaneously with taxi cabs at the same time. And another one, probably the most over the top one, is with three dimensional models sticking up outside. This is actually running in our city uh, at that time. This goes back at least 10, 12 years. In Chinatown, this particular slide actually comes from the Washington, D.C. Chinatown, but in Chinatown, it's an area that's very poorly been studied. And uh, this was a poster that I borrowed from a shopkeeper's uh, window, and uh, it was a fully Chinese-oriented marble poster just about five years ago. This was a film I saw in the uh, you know, with these ubiquitous uh, things. This is what I was getting at. This is a campaign that perpetuates itself because you can buy these with Marlboro coupons, and thus help pay for the cost of their ad campaign. The, the great icons of our city, of course, the Statue of Living World Trade Center, have always been co-opted by this industry, the proud smoke. And throughout the world, this is an international ad. Our city is known for the Statue of Liberty, and they've even been able to do this. It's almost graffitiing up the Statue of Liberty as a lucky strike. So we created, in the New York State Journal, uh, a, a parody, which was uh, the big appall. And it was the Statue of Liberty and an ashtray holding up a lighter and so forth, with each of the skyscrapers representing a different brand. And we created a statue of Nicotina that followed around the tobacco industry's tour of the Bill of Rights. 
Uh, across the river, the Marvel Meadowlands Grand Prix ran right through the mid-1990s, and there was good discussion in the late 1990s that that race was going to wind up right here in Manhattan, and that's still not off the drawing board. There may well be a Formula One race or a or a kart race or an Indy car race here in Manhattan. A, a typical uh, child or teenager wearing his uh, t-shirt. A little boy. These are just random shots. I could have shown you a thousand of these. Meanwhile, the video arcade games. It took us to the early 1990s to get rid of these images in uh, video arcade games, and some of them may still be around. Out in Belmont, uh, the Marlboro Cup was uh, really the fourth biggest horse race after the Triple Crown for a long time, and this was a major area to reach the opinion leaders in our city. Uh, soccer, a very huge sport worldwide, was coming to New York, and this is the first on the block was Philip Morris to get in on this. Heavily involved with Hispanic populations, uh, especially those that have moved to New York, they have even associated Winston directly with Puerto Rico. I mean, it's absolutely a one-to-one -one correlation. It has 80% of the market share in Puerto Rico, and if you go into the bodegas, Winston is very, very popular still today. New York is the second leading Hispanic market. We should always keep that in mind. Um, Skoll is fitting tobacco, very heavily marketed to Latino population. Uh, in uh, upper New York, upper Manhattan, we had bus shelters. A typical one there, cool guy for Benson and Hedges. Meanwhile, uh, at the Beacon Theater and other venues throughout the country, the Benson and Hedges Blues Festival was going on. Another way that synergistically matched advertising with promotion. New York is the number one African American market. We need to keep that in mind as we plan campaigns. For years, Philip Morris has produced the Guide to Black Organizations. They have been very close. Now it's online. They don't actually produce the printed version. Meanwhile, in magazines like Essence and uh, the Editor has never run and had uh, an article on smoking in its uh, 50 years, as far as I know. Uh, they talk about the drug prices on the front cover and, and, and so you say on the back cover. Uh, when Philip Morris was confronted by uh, the, the push for an advertising ban in the late 1980s, it convened a group at Philip Morris of 92 black publishers who condemned the notion that there should be an, a ban on advertising tobacco because this was the mainstay of African American publications like the Amsterdam News. This week's Amsterdam News does have a quarter page ad for the uh, uh, American Ballet Theater, which is still more sponsored. So this is the corporate sponsorship that the, the industry has been shifting on for 40 years. It didn't just begin when the massive settlement was, was uh, con uh, conducted. This uh, shift over to corporate uh, buying of influence has been a major part in the grew up in New York. They speak your language. Um, in Harlem, uh, the Studio Art Museum has been a major recipient of, of Philip Morris uh, Lorgette. Uh, there it is. It's, it's a wonderful museum and unfortunately uh, been a very heavily uh, funded by Philip Morris. Uh, out on the street, uh, they were actually championing their cleanup uh, operations, which again, I can't verify or not, but they were there. They knew where to go and they have reached their market very effectively. Meanwhile, uh, Reverend Buss has uh, undertaken in the late 1980s an effort to uh, reface billboards, and I think he should be commended for his pioneering work. Typical shots of New York now. 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 And I love this. this is, you, know, you got your health and beauty aids. And that leads into Wayne Reed. Wayne Reed literally has these things. Can you imagine the pharmacy? We now sell cigarettes at the state minimum prices. They're advertising. It's not just a lost leader. It's a big deal. It's a big, big deal. Uh, you can even go in and get your smoke up through your nicotrol next to your model. I mean, it's an absolute uh, absurdity, but this is what goes on. Beth Israel, I hate to say it, they're right across the street, but uh, you know, this is what they were doing. Now, I know spiral CT is pretty good, but this was way before then. They were still saying, you know, come in to see us about your lung cancer. In other words, don't talk to me, just get an x-ray and we'll do diagnostic tests. This is really, really, I think, one of the more pitiful examples of where our hospital system, private and public, has not really been a part of this issue. This is, to our credit, I don't even know who did this. This is one of the only anti-smoking ads I've ever seen. To quit smoking and you'll kiss you, even if you're not Irish. I do not know who did that. I saw it in Times Square. Uh, if anyone knows any background behind this, I'd, I'd love to know. But this is more of what you're saying. Uh, anybody smoke? We have people smoking? This is the problem. We need a few people in this room who smoke because you're not aware, as I'm not aware, I try to be, I try to do ethnographic understanding of what it's like, short of actually doing it, because this is there, this is ubiquitous. And uh, as have been all of these things, this is 
Institute's uh, Lincoln Center, which is still going on with Philip Moore. Uh, this is the American Ballet Theater. I walked by there last night. It's still being sponsored by Philip Morris. Uh, as is the City Opera tonight by Philip Morris. Uh, as is the Guggenheim, which has a, a recent exhibition sponsored by Philip Morris Companies Incorporated. At the Met, in 1984, uh, we looked at this exhibition sponsored by the Vatican. Uh, that's right, the Vatican Art Treasure, sponsored by Philip Morris. Uh, they said when the New York Times asked, Philip, asked uh, the Vatican about that, they said, why are you allowing a cigarette company to do this? They said, oh, it's not Philip Morris cigarette company, it's Philip Morris uh, International. That's how they differentiated it. And uh, so we got a group of about uh, 40 people to stand there, you know, doing our little house call. And uh, uh, this is one of the handouts we had, the Vatican Company sponsored the art, and saying again. And we, we borrowed this particular one from Australia, which had done some wonderful work. In Brooklyn, I've never seen this in any museum. Right here on the entrance to your museum. That's just absolutely astounding. I love that museum. And this is, this is just uh, terrible. Uh, or BAM, perhaps the most avant-garde music and art festival anywhere in the world, is right here, sponsored primarily by Philip Morris. And, you know, right down across from Grand Central, the Philip Morris uh, Whitney Museum of Art at Philip Morris, there was a group of school children coming out of here and I asked the teacher if I could take, uh, ask them a question. They said, sure. I said, kids, what does Philip Morris make? And one little girl raised her hand. She said, paintings. And I think that's really how we're not able to distinguish what they're thinking from what we're thinking. This last point is Tony Schwartz. Tony and I worked on a number of campaigns. We talked about radio earlier today. I hope this projects a little bit. But this is, uh, by the way, Tony and I were barfing into our barf or barf bags that we created. But this is one of the ads that Tony created directed at the mayor. Mayor Koch, the mayor of New York, made a statement about New York City's bathhouses being closed down due to AIDS. He said, This is a matter that involves a lot of money to these people. They are selling death. Places where death can be distributed. We don't want that to go on. But I wonder, Mayor Koch, did you ever stop to think that you could make the same statement about cigarette companies? They are selling death. So why does the city allow cigarettes to be advertised on city bus shelters? They are selling death. Why does the city allow cigarettes to be sold on public property? They are selling death. Why does the city allow cigarettes to be advertised in the city radio station's guide? They are selling death. And why does the city allow cigarettes to be advertised on subway trains, buses, and city licensed taxi cabs? They are selling death. Mayor Koch, cigarette companies are selling death. We don't want that to go on. And like you, we don't want that to go on. Paid for by Doc, representing thousands of physicians who really do care. Some things are so much with us that we hardly notice them anymore. But they affect us whether we are aware of them or not. Advertising is like that. And the most heavily advertised product in the world is cigarettes. More than half of the billboards you're likely to see are selling this single product. And what they're selling is a hoax. This ad tells you that smoking is likely to make you into a man. It's more likely to make you into a corpse. But I had to come all the way up here to read the health warning in the fine print at the bottom of the ad. Now here in the subways, we have a bit more realistic ad. Discover where today's smokers are heading. Well, at least we have a pretty good idea where that is. Let's take the idea that we're not, advertising basically doesn't make the product unique. It makes it commonplace. And that's the most important thing to understand about it. Let me give you an example of how that functions. If you walk out of your house and you live in the city or in the suburbs and you see someone on the street every day when you walk out, after a while, you may not know that person, and after a while, you may just nod to them or smile 
or say good morning, but that's the limit of your involvement with them. But if you go out to Nevada, if you live in New York and you go out to Nevada and you stop at a gas station and you see that person there, you'd stop and say, hi, how are you? What are you doing here? Did you, uh, you get out here often and so forth? Uh, when did you leave New York? Well, that's how advertising functions in the marketplace. The advertising makes the product a friend, makes the product, product acceptable, makes it known, makes it commonplace. It's really a form of, of, of re retouching. It's retouching a bad image to, uh, by making people think they're wonderful people, that they, they uh, give to, to minority groups, they give to, uh, to uh, women's tennis, they give to, to uh, uh, the black uh, theater groups and so forth. And what's happening? The smoking among these groups is, is going up. Uh, the, the deaths in these groups are going up. It's, uh, it's, it's bad. Tobacco may be grown in places like North Carolina and Virginia, but the center of the tobacco business is here in New York. This is the world headquarters of Philip Morris, the largest cigarette company and the makers of the top-selling brand Marlboro. Philip Morris and other cigarette makers like Lowe's, American Brands, RGR Nabisco, and British American Tobacco are in the business of pushing a deadly addiction, what the National Institute on Drug Abuse has called our most lethal form of drug dependence. Yet, unlike other drug pushers, the men and women who work for these companies do not have to enter the underworld to stay in business. Indeed, companies like Philip Morris enjoy the same respect and prestige as any other big business. How do they manage to pull it off in the face of their products having killed millions of people? The answer has been advertising and promotion. of cigarette advertising isn't just to sell cigarettes. Placed in the proper influential context, it can also buy respectability and complacency. This is where tobacco country comes to the big city. And what could be more big city than the New York Times, perhaps the most influential and respected newspaper in the world. And each and every week in the New York Times magazine are cigarette advertisements for Winston and the designer brand Ritz and other brands. But it's not just the magazine. It's also in the entertainment section for country music, the sports section for tennis. And in the same issue of the New York Times was a 115-page magazine on good health. Wouldn't you know it? Not one mention of smoking in the entire magazine. But is the New York Times merely a passive, even reluctant recipient of tobacco advertising as a means of defending freedom of the press and the First Amendment? Not exactly. This is the United States Tobacco and Candy Journal, a magazine published for the tobacco trade here in New York. And this is an advertisement for the New York Times, urging you to put your cigarette advertisements in the New York Times with the slogan, lifestyles are made, not born. I'm amused at how the 
people in the advertising community, advertising agency executives, of the, some of the leading advertising agencies, attack political advertising as immoral. And I'm amused because uh, I know of no politician except the president who, by pushing the button for the atomic uh, uh, affair, could, you know, atomic uh, warfare, could, no politician, politician could do more harm to you than a pack of cigarettes can or a can of bad soup. And yet they talk about the immorality of political advertising and not about the immorality of selling products that kill that kill half a million Americans a year. Pardon me if I seem just a little bold, but it's just because I got myself another dip of school. And I keep my little tin of wintergreen handy in the pocket of my new designer jeans. Just a pinch between my finger and my thumb Makes me feel like a million Makes me feel like a long home run I'm a soul-dipping, soul-dipping man I'm a soul-dipping, soul-dipping man I'm a soul-dipping, soul-dipping man I am a soul-dipping man now just a peep, just what the scope between my gum and cheek Gives me just the snuff I need, no I can't be beat And I keep it in the pocket on my hip So I won't be far from my skull and another dip 